Okay, so hello everyone. So we, we are here in a beautiful place with air condition. And <laughs> so to, to, today we have Philip and he will talk about database agnostic tool that is called IBIS. Stage is yours. Thank you. How's the sound? Good? Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming to the talk. Let's see if we can make this full screen. Great. Uh, so my name is Philip Cloud. I'm here to talk to you about IBIS. And uh, because SQL is everywhere, but you probably don't want to use it. And during this talk, I thought maybe I should change the talk to be a bit more friendly to, to, Py, uh, to SQL. So that's what we changed it to. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Voltron Data. Uh, Gil, who is in the audience, uh, uh, is my wonderful colleague. And we kind of collaborated on this presentation together. And this is where you can find us on the internet. Uh, so IBIS is a lightweight Python library for, for data wrangling. And let's kind of set the stage here. So all these people work on IBIS. They're lovely. Thank you to all these people. And just a show of hands, who's, who's done some of these things? Translated data analysis from pandas to PySpark, prototyped in pandas, and then thrown that thing over the wall to a data engineer, uh, been the data engineer on the other side of that wall, um, and you used Parquet as sort of an interchange format between different process. OK, so like many people have done at least one of these things. And none of these tools are bad. They're all actually, it's quite the opposite. A lot of these tools are very useful and, and good at what they do. Um, throwing things over walls is probably not a great idea. And in the, in kind of, in Pi data land, we're working, you know, in, in sort of a, a particular area. Like we've got all these great tools and users are, people are using these tools. And a lot of the tools here assume that your data is local and that it fits in memory. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad assumption. If your data are local and fit in memory, you should probably just keep doing that. But if they're, if they're not, let's say you, know, you work in an enterprise where that isn't the case, uh, you know, the, some of these tools aren't going to work very well. So let's take a look at what, that, what a workflow might look like where you're sort of interacting with, with data that are non-local. You've got pandas on the left here, local execution, and on the right, you've got a remote engine. Let's say it's Postgres, but it could be a number of different engines. You're going to connect that database. You're going to pull out the table. And you're going to actually pull all of that table into memory. You're going to, it's going to you know, take it in whatever wire format Postgres has, probably turn it into like a list of tuples. Uh, and, then t and then that's going to go into pandas. You're going to load that data and do some, some data analysis. But if you run out of memory, you're kind of out of luck, right? It does, doesn't scale particularly well. And you're kind of treating this thing on the right as a, as a fancy file system. It's not, you're not really taking advantage of anything that that has to offer. Um, maybe you, you, you know, you're wasting a lot of money. You're leaving scalability and performance on the table. And this pattern does show up, especially if you're working in an enterprise where Somebody hands you a thing, and you're like, they're like, do your job. And you're like, but I only have pandas, or I only have you know, Python lists, or something like that. But you still need to iterate quickly, right? You want to maybe operate on that data set locally. And it's like, OK, well, now if you're operating on that locally, you still have this kind of translation problem, where you need to turn your local stuff into a production thing. And that's this sort of translation problem, where you're going from pandas to PySpark, or SQLite to Trino, or DuckDB to Snowflake, or Polars to whatever. Uh, and <clears throat> things are just different locally than they are in production. But it's like, how do we bridge that gap? Well, one of the tools that sort of nominally promises to do this is, is SQL. But it's like, OK, we need, to, we need to talk about SQL. It's the structured query language. has been around for many decades. You've probably written a little bit of it, uh, but most importantly, it's sort of it's everywhere, and it's often between you and the th and the and the data and the, the and you and doing your job. Um, but it's not without its problems. Uh, some of the pros: it's standardized and concise, and you know it's always a good sign when things have 
asterisks or little swords next to them, you know, that's all, that always, it's a pro. Um, it's hard to test, though, and it can be pretty inscrutable if you've never worked for it, work, worked for it, uh, worked with it. <clears throat> um, the feedback loop can be slow, and it sort of depends on what kind of SQL system you're using. But let's take a look at what that workflow, let's sort of continue down this path, look at what that workflow looks like with SQL. So the idea is that you're, you sort of just write SQL, and you always execute the SQL, and there's no difference between dev and prod. It's not a super tight loop here, uh, but let, let's see what that looks like. So you're, you've conjured a query somehow. You, you can only use Vim or Emacs. That's, that's a rule. Um, you connect to the database. You send that, data, that query to the, to the database. The database executes the query, and you get your results back. Maybe you pull down a local sample, uh, SQLite, DuckDB, some other tool that, only re that doesn't require you know, you know, 10,000 nodes in a cluster to run. So you're, lo you're iterating locally. You're kind of going through this fast cycle. You've got your final SQL query. You connect to the database. You send that SQL query over. You execute the query. You get your results back. And it's like, done, OK? Talk over, problem solved. And it's like, not really. So you have this, trans, this sort of SQL dialect translation problem. And if, you're, if you haven't encountered this before, welcome to hell. Um, let's, so let, but like, let's take a, a look at a simple data cleaning task. It's like, it's like our SQL standards standard. We've got a table on the left that's sort of been ingested as uh, strings. And like we kind of see that we maybe want to turn some of those things into numbers and get the thing on the right. Straightforward task. We've already got some divergence in SQL dialects right here. On the top, we've got SQLite. We've got to cast our string to a real 53 and cast our, our num votes to an integer. And then we've got Postgres on the bottom. And uh, we've got to cast average rating now to a double precision column and num votes as big int. And then it's like, well, SQLite doesn't really have a notion of types. and like, are you going to remember what real 53 means? Like, maybe if you get burned by this enough, but hopefully you don't have to get burned. Maybe your colleague comes along and is like, oh, we need to update the, the queries, and they forget to update Postgres, and now you've got this divergence here. So that's, that's really, that's pretty not great. And they're, they're, these are like the same thing, mostly. You've also got this problem of parameterization, where do you, like, are you running one big query? Are you executing 1,000 small queries with like, varying one or more parameters? Um, you know, maybe you're looking for movies, and you want to look at keywords, and you want to change the set of keywords you're looking for. How are you going to loop over that SQL? Are you going to generate a big pile of, uh, of unions and sort of concatenate the results together? Are you going to ex execute them one by one, send a, a, you know, a thousand queries? Maybe the thousandth query has a typo, and you need to, and you're going to execute all 999 that come before, and you're going to wait for that thousandth to actually fail. And that's not great. We also want to write our Python code. We want to write code in Python. And ideally, we can write this with a data frame API. And we, we don't really want to write SQL. It can be concise. Some operations are hard to spell. There's things like recursive common table expressions, which are the seventh level of hell um, once you get past SQL dialects. And so we have this problem where we, we want to translate things from you know, A to B. We want to parameterize things, maybe. We want to use Python. And we don't want to write a bunch of SQL strings. And so my, everyone, me included, when presented with this problem, initially thinks, I'll just generate strings. And it's like, I think we can agree just as doing a lot of work in that sentence. So let's go back to our example. SQLite, Postgres. We've got this sort of casting problem, or this sort of transformation of, of input data that we want to do. And it starts off simple enough. We've got a format string. We've got a function that's sort of given a dialect and a type, gives us back like the proper type for that dialect. And everything's fine. We've just got a couple of formats parameters in here. 
format string, cool, no problem. It's like, okay, well, function names can differ, function argument order can differ, some databases implement like log base B with the base in the first or the second argument. That's annoying. Um, certain functions are like more optimized than others. Some functionality may be available as a composition of functions, but not as a specific function. Output formats vary wildly. You might be able to get something very efficiently in Pyro, or you might have to go the list of tuples route. There's a lot of sort of, you know, dimensions here that vary. And then pr with parameterization in the mix, now you potentially have to format string those things too, so you're like templating your parameters, which are then going into another format string. And then you've got outside factors, which are more or less out of your control. Someone comes to you and says, oh, it'd be great if we could X. Uh, we'll just fix that later. Um, this is a high priority request from the boss. And again, fine, totally fine. It's like, okay, also fine. Like we just wanna now do a join, right? All I, all I did here was like add the left join on basics on the T const column. It's like, okay, maybe this is fine too. Um, we, we have like a, maybe a different ratings table location or it's maybe it's in a different schema or, and then we've got the ratings join column, which maybe it's a different column name because we've cast one to a, an int and we wanna keep the original string. And it's like, it's, it slowly starts to become insane, right? I mean, now we've got, we've got char index and we're like looking for keywords and it's like we've got different case for the key. I mean, some of this is just bad software engineering practice. Um, but like, <clears throat> I mean, honestly, who can say that this wouldn't happen at their job? And if like, if you raising your hand, great, that's, you should stay there. Uh, but like, and then we've got like percents now, and like percent is like the like glob operator in SQL, but also like kind of the old school Python format meta character. And we've got functions that are returning functions that are going into, the, I mean, it's just, I mean, no. Um, and so Gil pulled this, this tweet, which is, SQL is really difficult at first, but once you use it regularly and you learn more about it, it's even worse. Actually, it's not a tweet. I think this is from Mastodon. A, a toot. Thank you. So it's like, no, like, I'm, I'm good. No thanks. Not going to use SQL. Uh, there, there is the, the, this, this really important fact that people have been working on SQL databases for 50 plus years, and it turns out the, the research in both academia and industry has churned out some really fast and efficient execution engines. <clears throat> so, by not using SQL, you're leaving a bunch of stuff on the table. So wh where does it leave us? Well, we've got SQL standards, which are not really standard. SQL could be convoluted. String generation is a nested hellscape. Um, but we still want to write stuff in Python, and we want to take advantage of modern query engines. What if, instead of generating strings by hand, you can use a type-safe data frame API that eventually generates strings? That's what IBIS is. It's a lightweight Python library for data wrangling. The data frame API interfaces to 16 plus query engines, and it's got a, a deferred execution model. It's, uh, it's similar to, uh, for people who are familiar with R, similar to uh, li libraries like dplyr and dbplyr. It sort of combines the functionality that is in both of those into one. And so let's take a look at what that looks like in our, in our sort of you know, example execution flow here. Locally, we've got IBIS, we connect to the database, we pull out our table, we pull just back enough information to get the schema, which is the column names and the types. We build our expression, validate the expression, compile it to SQL, send that query to the database, execute the query, and get back our results. So it's very similar to our previous one, except there's, there's a bunch of translation that is now being handled by IBIS. And all that, that query is going to be executed by the, the thing on the right. So you're, you're getting the advantages of whatever, you know, execution capabilities that thing has. And most likely the data are probably going to be close to that query engine. 
One interesting and useful consequence of this design is that if your metadata is stored in a different place than the query engine, you can, those things can work together. Because IBIS only needs to know the table names, the column names, and their types. You can take that even further and you can just say, well, I already know the column names and the types and the table name, and I'm just going to declare this sort of abstract table that's not tied to a particular engine. And I'm going to do my, I'm going to build my sort of my query up from that. And the way that this, is, this, can, this sort of works reliably is that IBIS kind of has its own built-in type system. Um, and this is, this is what it, it, it kind of looks like to, to build up this expression without tying it to a particular backend. You've got a table ratings. It's got these column names and their types. And if you try to do something nonsensible, like compare a string column to a, a number, it's going to tell you, hey, yeah, you, you can't do that. Uh, but of course, you can cast, and then things, things will work. And then, of course, this cast will do the right thing depending on what particular backend you decide to compile it against. All right, demo time. Let's see if we can make this work. Okay. Let's see. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm just going to go make these match. It'll be easier. I won't have to stare. All right. Is that, can everybody back there see? Sweet. All right, so I'm in, I'm in, uh, I'm in IPython. I'm going to import uh, kind of the interactive set of stuff from IBIS. I'm going to pull uh, up this duck, uh, this is, sorry, this is SQLite. <clears throat> And here I've got, I've got this IBIS backend thing. And the data set we're going to be looking at is a list, uh, sorry, is, uh, is two, two tables. It's from IMDB. It's um, movie information and ratings about those movies. So let's pull out the basics table. We're going to say con table basics. And the screen is, the, it's pretty big, so a lot of the columns may be, may be cut off here, but we've, uh, we've got a, a few columns here. Tcons, which is a join key, um, title type, primary title, original title, and then you can, of course, look at what the columns are here. We've got some other things. Um, so let's start sort of filtering down some of these, some of these things. So we're going to say basics, and we're going to filter out, uh, we're going we're gonna to take only movies. Okay, probably. Ah, sorry. The first thing we're going to do is actually just uh, snake case everything because camel case makes my eyes hurt. Uh, so you can do that in IBIS with uh, this sort of uh, special sort of relabel method. And before we had those camel case columns, and now we've got all snake case columns. So that's pretty nice. Let's go with our filter now. We're going to filter um, only movies. Everything's sort of happening like instantaneously. No computation is being done. We're just sort of building up this expression tree. Um, so now, before we had only shorts in the title type column, now we've got movies. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's keep this PG and filter out the adult movies. Um, cool. We've got that. And Let's just keep the titles here. So the way you select, subselect, so we subset, yeah, we subselected on rows using filter, and we can subset on columns using the select method. So we're going to keep t const. Let's see if I've got it here. Basics dot select, and we're going to keep primary title. So those are kind of the things we care about for the purposes of of the demo here. So now we've just got these two columns. Cool. And one nice thing about IBIS is that at any point, you can ask it to tell you what SQL it's going to generate. And some of it's cut off because the screen's big, but that's sort of, you can see the filter there, and then it's subsetting these columns. Um, and so you can look at, look at the SQL there. So let's pull out the ratings table now. We're going to say con table ratings. Ratings is a bit simpler. Again, we've sort of got this problem where some of them are strings and we don't necessarily want them to be. <clears throat> so let's fix that. You can, you, can, you can sort of 
update columns in place, and, and nothing's actually being mutated on the, in, the, in the database. Um, but what we can do is, uh, let's see, we've got average ratings. I'm just going to complete that. So what we're doing here is taking average rating, casting that to a flow 64, and then taking num votes and casting that to an n64. Uh, of course, uh, I need to do the camel ca uh, the the case renaming again, relabel snake case, uh, and let's let's not add this plural here. Cool. So now we've got our numbers, and you'll see that the sort of the way it's printed is slightly different now. The previous one had a green had green content, and this one has sort of a turquoise or teal. And, that, and it's also kind of to the right, so that's, that's kind of another visual indication that you've, you've gotten actual, uh, you know, uh, typed values out, not just strings. And so the thing that we're, we are potentially interested in is we want to see, like, the top 10 movies uh, by, uh, by rating. And so, of course, to do that, we need to do a join, right? And you wouldn't be using a relational database probably if you couldn't join things. So let's show... What that looks like basics. Uh, basics. We're going to join basics with ratings, and we're going to do it on that t const column. And again, that's that's instantaneous. We haven't actually done any joining yet. And if you try to map for this table, it's going to be it's not going to be instantaneous. The database is going to do enough of the join that it can produce ten rows, because um, that's sort of how we we do this this wrapper here quickly. We just take a limit of the of the underlying expression. And then we can do basics ratings. Uh, oh, we probably also want to filter out movies that have a low number of ratings. Sorry, low number of votes. So we're going to say basics, filter basics, ratings, num votes greater than 100,000. And now we've got a slightly different uh, wrapper here. And notice all the num votes, uh, the num votes column respects our, our filter here. M, I don't know what that movie is. Um, that's, that's fun. Some of these you might recognize, Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, Gone with the Wind. Um, and then finally, we can do, let's see, ratings. We can sort by the average rating and then take the, say, let, let, let's get the top uh, 10, not 15. Top 15. Okay, top 15. So that actually takes a little bit of time, and now we've got sort of our, our top, top 10 here. And it, the sort order is, is not stable because it's only sorted on average rating, and there's a few matches. Um, so Schindler's List, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, The Dark Knight are all tied, and Shawshank Redemption apparently is, is the top one. And there's a, there's, there's a bunch of other stuff you can do, but just uh, due, to, due to time limitations, I'm not going to show you the rest uh, of what Ibis can do, uh, but, but that, is the, that is the demo. Um, so let's go back to the slides. All right, so what do we see? Uh, we didn't actually, I, oh, okay, there's one, actually, there's one other thing I wanted to show. Well, actually, I can't show it yet, or now, but uh, I will show that to anyone that is interested afterward. Um, we saw select, filter, and join, and the thing that uh, I didn't get to show you was that it can run against multiple back, run the same expression against multiple backends. Um, that's a really powerful feature of Ibis, uh, and the data we're using is is at uh, you can find it here at uh, at the IMDb website for this data set. Uh, these are all the supported backends that we have. I'm not going to list them all. Um, they can be found on our website, which is ibis-project.org. And hopefully, it's clear that you can now, you can see that with Ibis, it's a lot easier to scale from development to production with a lot less rewriting. But there's a bunch of stuff that, uh, not a bunch, there's a few things that sort of are not yet solved or perhaps not solvable. Um, all these engines, especially the ones that are, are, that are distributing their execution, uh, will not give you the same floating point results, right? I mean, the, the addition, for example, like in a summation, is not going to be commutative if you're doing the summation in different threads or different machines. So like the sum of a col float column from DuckDB is going to be different from the sum of a float column uh, from Snowflake 
you know, at, at sort of the way down of the decimal range, the decimal points. Regexes are not a thing that we can translate or th that we do translate, like taking a Perl regular expression that supports backtracking and putting it into an RE2 regular expression that doesn't support backtracking is not going to be a thing that IBIS will uh, help you with. And then data-dependent function behavior. Uh, so the, the casts that we were sort of showing before are, the, they, like, they were actually, in some cases, removing the new lines, because that's what DuckDB does. Uh, it'll remove any trailing white space from like a thing that looks like a number when you're casting it. Data fusion doesn't do that. So that, that sort of, that, that's sort of a data-dependent function behavior. Um, we think it's going to be less work than write, rewriting pandas as a Spark data frame. So what's next? A uh, bunch, of, bunch of different features. Uh, we just released 6.1, and then the 6.x series, we've got cross-dialect .sql support. .sql is a cool method that allows you to bring an existing SQL query and just make it into an IBIS expression. Now in 6.1, we support bringing a SQL expression from any dialect to any other dialect. So you can bring your Snowflake query and run it against DuckDB. Uh, we've got uh, UDFs in a few backends, Snowflake, DuckDB, DataFusion, PySpark, Postgres, and maybe a couple others. We've got an Oracle backend, which Gil built in a couple hours at the last conference we were at, I think. The, sorry, two conferences ago. Uh, two Torch, which you can so you, you'll kind of get back a dictionary of Torch, uh, Torch tensors. And we've got support for the Dunder Data Frame API, um, which is kind of leading into the next thing that uh, we're, we're working on, which is really tight vis vis uh, visualization integrations with Vega Fusion and Altair. Somebody last night requested table sampling. Uh, we're working on a pattern matching system that allows you to manipulate uh, IBIS expressions themselves and your requests. We're definitely interested in, in hearing feedback and in feature requests and bug reports. Happy to take questions if I have time. Um, this, is, this is where you can find us and how you can get our things. So thank you, Philip. And applause. So I think we have two minutes for questions. Any questions? Yeah. So everything is recorded, so please wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you. Super interesting. Um, how how complex can these queries and joins get? Because I, I think I looked at maybe not IBIS, but some kind of database abstraction tools before. And the problems I had was that I use a lot of Postgres and a lot of common table expressions. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, beyond the sort of simple select and join, you start to need a bit these features of SQL. So how, how complex can you get these kind of queries? Uh, so for... I, I think the main SQL feature we don't support is recursive common table expressions. Um, common table expressions themselves are a thing that you could throw at IBIS as like a SQL string and it'll whatever, kind of do, do, it'll just kind of inline that query. But you tend to not need to explicitly write a common table expression because IBIS will lift subqueries out into the common table expression for you. Um, as far as functionality goes, I mean, we've got We've got, we've got really good support for complex types. Um, we've got support for geospatial stuff, um, window functions. Um, yeah, I, don't, I mean, you can get, pretty, you can get pretty, pretty complex. I mean, I can, I can show you some stuff uh, later. Cool, thanks. Yeah. OK, so if, if you have more questions to Philip, please catch him after the presentation. So thank you again. Thanks, Peter.